Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our first presentation of the year. And it's a great pleasure I'd like to hand over to Irene to introduce our first speaker. Great. Over to you, you, Irene. Thank you, Nicholas. So our song, Come on, Irene, Thana Coon, Boatam Falcha, Akbar, Reb, Shauna Brosnahan, and Oct. On behalf of Anadan Heritage Society, I would like to welcome Sean Brosnahan here tonight, um, who's joining us from New Zealand with quite a large contingent we're delighted to see from New Zealand. Um, when we met to speak about people who we would like to have talk, uh, to do talks for our society, Sean was one of the first names that popped into our head and we were absolutely delighted when he accepted our invitation to talk. Uh, Sean is a curator at the Hope <laughs> Get This Right, Toy Two uh, Otago Settlers Museum. And Sean, of course, has very well established connections to Anadown through his Ford, Crow, Scully, and Finnerty family. Um, Sean has been a great friend to the Heritage Society for quite a number of years now. And um, you know, we are delighted that we're able to welcome him tonight. He's done extensive research into the early Irish settlers. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the talk. Please do join us for a question and answer session afterwards. If anybody would like to pose any questions through the chat facility, please do, and we'll get them to Sean. And without further ado, I'll hand you over to Sean now. You're very welcome, Sean. Thank you. Okay then, well, dear Gweave, Agus Fulcher, and to all New Zealanders here, kia ora tātou, no mai hari mai. It's a great pleasure for me this morning to have this opportunity to connect up with the Anadown Historical Society in a virtual fashion. I've been doing it by email correspondence for a, for a long time and to see a face for Paul and for Irene in particular is, is quite a delight. Um, and, and also just to share this information and to sort of set up that connection between the Galway end of the story and the New Zealand end, that's really fabulous. But I think I should um, begin by just saying that New Zealand really isn't particularly important to Ireland as an immigrant destination historically. Only a tiny part of the huge migrant outflow of the 19th and 20th centuries headed our way. But conversely, Ireland is really important to New Zealand because a very significant proportion of our pioneer immigrants did come from Ireland. Not as many as came from England or Scotland, but a large proportion nonetheless, and especially in the 1870s when they made up up to a quarter of all the immigrants of that time. Now, breaking it down, we could say the same thing about Galway. Otago and Southland aren't particularly important as immigrant destinations from Anadown compared, I expect, to all the other places that people from the parish immigrated to. But Anadown and the neighbouring parishes are really significant to Otago and even more to Southland because of how many families whose forebears began the New Zealand story in these places trace their ancestral roots back to East Galway. And there's one other factor I suppose that we could consider too, and that is that this is the furthest destination that anyone from Galway could possibly have gone in the world. So as far as the diaspora goes, that probably just gives it a little bit more historical significance. I think it also sets up quite nicely the challenge involved in understanding why so many Galway people ended up in Otago and South in the 1850s and 60s. I'm not gonna talk much about that, but I'm more interested in focusing on exactly how they did it. And we're gonna look at that in quite a bit of detail tonight. Now, it's always tricky with a migration story to grasp the story at both ends of the journey because it involves mastering the history of two quite diverse places. And that's why I think uh, Ireland reaching out, the website and, you know, the Anadown Historical Society in particular are so useful and important in giving us the ability to link the two parts of the story up and share the context that we both at either end know our story, but we're very hazy sometimes about the other end of the picture. And, and this gives us a chance to, to get to grips with the real nitty gritty aspects at both ends of the story. So I really, really welcome that. And it's something that I've wanted to do for literally decades. And, you know, back in the day, had, had to try to sort of establish connections with people in Ireland. And it, it just wasn't possible back in the 80s and 90s, but now it is, and that's just fabulous. So thanks for this opportunity to, to make something of that. But to set things up tonight, I want to just begin by explaining how I came to investigate these matters in the first place. And it's all about whakapapa, or lines of descent. Yeah, it's a Maori word for lines of descent. I come from a family that's strongly rooted in two places, South Canterbury, and Otago and South Crow. Irish friends 
I'll just uh, show you a little map of New Zealand here. Just give me a second. Can you see that? You can, yeah. You can? Okay. So South Canterbury and Otago and South make up the areas beneath that red line on the map. So that's the area we're talking about, but particularly Otago and South, which are further down, below Omaru, past the Waitaki River. So south where you can see Omaru, south of that, that's the area that we're talking about tonight, the southern part of the South Island of New Zealand. Now both, can you still see me as well? Uh, no, I think you've got your camera turned off. Probably. Okay, well, I'll just put stop share. Now you can see me again? No, I think your camera is still off. Oh, really? Have you, never, have you not been able to see me the whole time? No. <laughs> oh, I wish you had told me that. Okay. Um, I want to start. The video. Okay. Can you see me now? You can. Yes. You can. <laughs> okay, this is what I look like. Wow. <laughs> That's interesting. All right. Now, if I go back to sharing screen, can you see both? I will find that down. All right, getting back to the story. So both of my parents come from families with historic roots in those two different geographical zones in the south part of New Zealand. And all my lines of descent are one little skinny English part uh, from Ireland. My mum's family was split evenly between Kerry and Galway, and my dad between Kerry, Tyrone, and Cabin. And there was a strong sense of connections on both sides of my family too. We had family reunions and we were very aware of the networks that extended out into our Catholic community, especially those of us who shared the Kerry and Galway roots. So I was a bit surprised and actually pretty disappointed when I got to university in the late 1980s and I was the first generation of my family to have a tertiary education. And I began to study history to find that there were glaring absences uh, in our historical record. Our stories, my Irish Catholic forebears, origin stories just weren't there in the general stories written about- oh, Yes, I've got it now. Okay, Thank, thanks to, I don't know why, but I've got now. Thank about you. About the Wi-Fi? Okay. But we were here. Our forebears had been part of the foundation period in both of those regions to make that so. So I want to know why they weren't in the history, why they were so strikingly absent. Now jumping ahead a bit, after university, I headed overseas. I made a flying visit to Ireland. I came back, then I had six months of unemployment trying to get a job, and I researched and began writing a book about our Kerry connections in South Canterbury, the Kerrytown Brosnans. You can see it on my website. Download it if you like. Then I got my first proper job at the Otago Early Settlers Museum, as it was called there here in Dunedin, as an archivist. Now, this was the perfect place to begin to follow up on the Otago side of my quest, and I duly began to investigate then the Galway people in the southern provinces early years. And what I quickly worked out was that the presence of Galway Catholics in 1850s Otago was even more extraordinary than I had originally thought. By all rights, they should never have been here. You see, Otago was a planned settlement, what's known as a Wakefield class settlement after the English migration theorist who came up with the notion of British colonies uh, in the far side of the world where they would take the very best parts of the English society and transpose them to a new location in the Antipodes and make better Britons there. Now, Otago's case, it wasn't the best bit of English society, but Scottish society. And Otago as a colony was founded to be a kind of a paradise in the South Seas for Scottish Presbyterians. Now, sadly for the Scots, right from the beginning, they couldn't actually rally enough of the right sort of Scottish pe people prepared to chance all their futures on a desolate shoreline at the bottom of the world to fill up the immigrant ships. And so right from the beginning, they had to include quite a significant minority of English people who were Anglicans or Methodists. And it was that national religious divide in early Otago which created considerable sectarian division here rather than the traditional Protestant Catholic one. But one thing that the English and the Scots could agree on in pioneer Otago, <clears throat> was that there was no place for Irish Catholics in their midst. Indeed, many of the Otago pioneers had actually left Scotland and England precisely to get away from the hordes of poor Irish that were then flooding into the large cities of both England and Scotland. And because of the huge distance involved and the significant costs, who got to come to Otago in those early years was pretty easy to control. So no Irish Catholics made it here as officially approved settlers from the beginning of the Otago settlement scheme in 1848 through to the mid 1850s. And in fact, 
only a tiny number of Scottish or English Catholics made it through as well. The control mechanism was pretty simple. Tight selection of all those who applied for passages on a very small number of sailing ships that were organized to come here from English and Scottish ports. Anyone applying, for instance, had to have a reference from both their employer and their minister. And you can imagine some Irish Catholic guy trying to fake it up, change his name or something. But when he had to get his reference from his minister, you know, there was no uh, hiding the fact that he was a Catholic. He wouldn't have gotten through. Okay. So there was a tight Presbyterian cordon drawn around Pioneer Otago, managed from Edinburgh and London, forced to accept English prospects when there weren't enough Scots, but never desperate enough in those early years to open the door to Irish peasants. And as I came to understand that context, I became fascinated with, well, then, how exactly did our forebears manage to pierce that veil? And I began to hunt for evidence of who might have been the very first to get through. Now this involved spending quite a bit of time at National Archives in Wellington, which then held all of the provincial records of Otago and South, and they've been returned to Dunedin since then. And I worked methodically through all the Otago immigration records that survived to try and find the rupture point, the moment when an Irish Catholic from Galway first made it into Otago. Now, if you want to read the conference paper that resulted and was subsequently published, you can find a copy on my website. I'll give you a reference later. I called it the Green of Otago, and it ended up being quite an influential piece of work one way or another. But just to cut to the chase tonight, the turning point turned out to be a mission from Otago to recruit additional labour from the neighbouring settlement of Victoria in Australia in 1855. And whereas the immigrant selectors in Britain were still at that point strictly accountable to the leader of the Otago settlers here in Dunedin, Captain William Cargill, who was determined on preserving that tight Scottish Presbyterian identity for new immigrants, the man they sent over to Melbourne, another Scotsman but who'd grown up in Portugal, William Reynolds, to open up the second migrant recruitment flow at a time when Otago was desperately short of labour, he doesn't seem to have been fussed at all about his recruits' national or religious origin. So it was that in February 1856, on the third shipload of people that came over here recruited in Victoria, <coughs> there was one William Kavner from Contenti Town Land in Anna Down, who secured passage <coughs> and duly arrived in Presbyterian Otago. That was it. And as far as excluding totally Irish Catholics thereafter, it was momentous because there was an Achilles heel in Otago's immigration support schemes, which now provided William Kavanagh, and there may have been others with him, who could bypass neatly that tight exclusion policy in Edinburgh. This allowed for people who were already in Otago, and hence undoubtedly of the right stamp of person, to nominate their friends and relations back home to receive subsidized passages on Otago bound ships. They called them nominated passages as opposed to assisted passages. Now, the people who did the nominating also had to commit to supporting these new recruits on arrival and they had to make down payments on their fares. But it opened up a way to get people here from Gaul, and Kavner was quick to seize upon it. And thus began a trickle of Galway migrants on ships that followed to Otago in the late 1850s that broadened into a small flow into the early 1860s as the new arrivals, likewise, as soon as they got here, nominated their friends and relations back in Galway. So the Anna down to, to Otago migration was firmly established in these years and its anchor point was William Kavner. Now I should say at this point that the actual records that survived were singularly deficient when it came to individual details. The actual passenger list and the correspondence relating to nominations, they don't survive. What did survive was the higher level correspondence about recruitment, communication with the immigrant recruiters and the provincial authorities. So at one level, what I could chart was official attitudes towards Irish immigrants, which remained very negative about the Irish in principle, but was now in the later period, at least open to taking them when it was the only way to fill up a ship that was already committed to head into Otago. And then I tried to connect that information to the fragmentary evidence of who the people who actually came were. 
<coughs> so that's what we're going to look at now, the evidence of this migration chain. Now, that same big labor shortage that had prompted the mission to Victoria in 1855 was followed by an even bigger effort to recruit new immigrants in Scotland and England. So in 1857, Otago sent back a, an agent whose job it was to recruit suitable candidates, and he had a job to get at least 2,000. His name was James Adam. And the first ship to carry out some of his new recruits was a ship called the George Canning. Its passengers would have included nominated passengers, and among them was William Cavanagh's brother, John. Now, the only official record of this voyage that now survives is, boom, how do I do this? Share the screen. There you go. Uh, next slide. Here is this, what's called the debtors list. And you can see down there, I've highlighted the bold, the George Canning, but you'll notice it's only got three names on it, whereas there are a lot more people on that ship than that. You see they've got numbers in front of their names and they've got amounts up. The numbers are the bill numbers, the debts they incurred to the provincial government for their assisted passages, the amounts are what they still owe when this list was published in 1869. And if you look at the numbers, there are heaps of numbers that are missing. Go back to the top of the page, you can see the Jill Blah, the ship that bought William Kavner here. His name's not on it. His bill number is missing. He's paid his debt off. And if you look down to the George Canning, there's no sign there of uh, John Kavner either. He likewise has paid his bill off and disappeared from the record. So this makes it very difficult to work out the details of who these people were when the real passengers simply don't survive. But we can supplement that with newspaper passengers like this one. Everyone can see this all right, I hope? Because here's the list that was published in the Dunedin newspaper when the George Canning arrived here in November, 1857. And there you can see on it, John and Anna Kavner. Now, I know from family information that's been given to me that Anna, who was a sister of John and William, didn't actually come on that ship. She pulled out, although she did come to Otago later on. So this, again, highlights some of the deficiencies in what the records are, you know, and how useful it is to supplement that with family knowledge where you can. Now, there were more Galway assisted immigrants who came on a couple of ships in 1859. I'm not going to show you their passenger list. But then on, uh, in 1860, a ship called the Gala arrived. And here we go look at the debtors list for the Gala in February 1860. And we can see here some Galway people, Pat and Honor Ford. And look who is nominating them. The name in brackets means the person in Otago who had put them up for this assisted passage. And it's none other than William Kavner. And look above him, John Cunningham, John Cahill. I think those are Galway people too, can't be certain. So that's really important. I think the honor Ford, in fact, might be the person that John Kavner subsequently married. Not certain of that. But we jump ahead to early 1861. The next ship to come with Galway people is the Lady Agidia. And you can see here where I've circled more people from Galway. We've had the Dillons there with John Dillon um, already here sponsoring them. We have Bridget Ford being sponsored by John Ford. Go down a bit, we see Thomas Kilkelly being sponsored by John Cahill. <coughs> so this tells us about people who are here and the people they were bringing out with them, although not much more. So that's really annoying. But nonetheless, it's something. And then we get the Melbourne. Now this is really important to me because I believe that this brought my um, great, great grandparents, Patrick Ford and Alan Crow. And you can see there the people I've highlighted. There's increasing numbers of people here from Galway and you can see the sponsors behind them. William Cavan is very busy. He's bringing out people who are clearly friends, I would imagine, as well as relations. The Fords are busy, Crows are busy, the Dillons are busy. It's, it's, you know, it's growing. For every new Irish immigrant you got here from Galway, they were onto it. Immediately they'd start nominating you know, their friends and relations back. So, so it's a small flow, but it's growing and growing and growing. And those people are creating a little network here of mutual support, which is pretty neat. But in the case of the Melbourne, where we've got the names here, we also have a more explicit passenger list appeared in the newspaper. Here it is here. It's a bit fuzzy, I'm sorry. But you can see there that I've actually noted where the people come from behind the names. That's really useful. So we get Anna Down quite specifically mentioned there in the case of the Fords. Um, in the case of the Anna, of the Kilkellys uh, and the Levens there. Uh, down below, we have some people from Drum, Drum Griffin and up above. So Drum Griffin's a town land in Anna Down. And there's some people just mentioned as being from Galway. So you can see there, that's really useful information that just adds to our knowledge base. 
And what it shows us, um, there's also some people from um, Cork and Waterford there that relates to another migration chain that I've also charted, but it's not relevant to our discussion today. What's important, I suppose, is that this tight Scottish Presbyterian cordon wrapped around Otago uh, in the early period has now been broken through. And it's William Kavner and his, those people who followed. Can you see me again now? Yeah, we could actually see you the whole way through, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. great. You can see me the whole way through. Well, I might mm. leave it at that then. Great. Okay, excellent. So they've broken through and they're just gradually accelerating the numbers that are coming. So that's just very good. Now, what's important about this in the New Zealand big picture is that the conventional wisdom used to be that it was the discovery of gold in Otago in mid-1861 that was the rupture point after which strictly controlled immigration to Otago became much more difficult, if not impossible, and lots of Irish began to arrive here, principally via Australia and the gold fields there. And broadly speaking, that's quite true. A flood of Irish did come here from every part of Ireland in the gold rush period of the 1860s. And that decisively shifted the nature of the pioneer population here and brought in the significant Otago bit. But what my research showed was that the Galway people were here before that. And in fact, because they were here before that, they were perfectly positioned to seize the opportunity that was offered by the gold being discovered. And I know that lots of these early Galway, Galway guys went up and were among the very first um, gold diggers, including my uh, great great grandfathers, William Scully and Paddy Ford. And Paddy Ford, in fact, is noted as making the very first long time a crucial piece of gold mine equipment for the prospect who discovered gold in the first place, um, Gabriel Reed. So that's our little family claim to fame. But both of them were on the gold fields. And like the other men, Thomas Kilkelly was up there as well. They made enough money on the gold fields to then invest in land in Otago and Southland. And that, that really is significant. It gave them that big lift in their colonial careers. And of course, enabled them to bring further people out from Anadown. So the Anadown people really did seize this magnificent opportunity to get to New Zealand that was opened up by William Kavanagh. And that is a remarkable achievement, given that context. You gotta to remember too, that there was absolutely no promotion or um, publicity of Otago in the south or west of Ireland in this period. Um, and all of those immigrants that made here purely got here because of their informal dissemination of detailed information about how you could do it. And you got to think as well as that, that the people that were disseminating the information were almost certainly people who had Irish as their first language and either little or no literacy skills. So that makes something that was impressive even more impressive. And I think it's fantastic and worth celebrating. But as I said, the gold discoveries did subsequently unleash a major influx of Irish into New Zealand through the 1860s. And then in the decade that followed the 1870s, there was a massive program of assisted immigration that was developed by um, what we call the Vogel schemes after the politician who initiated it. Initiated it. And that decade, the 1870s, proved to be the peak period of Irish immigration historically to New Zealand, with the Irish at times making up a quarter of all those coming on the government arranged uh, ships. And that did attract some controversy at the time in New Zealand, but again, we're not going to concern ourselves with that here. What I'll note, though, is that through both periods, through the 1860s and then through the 1870s and on through the 80s, as that's, those schemes continued, the Galway flow continued, though now it wasn't quite so important in the overall scheme of things. There were more people coming from other counties, but they were still coming. And as I've said already, uh, many of the Galway pioneers were early on the gold fields, did well there, invested their money in land, especially in Southland. And that's where I'm gonna turn my attention a little bit more now because the southernmost portion of the island at that stage was the least developed and it offered plenty of potential with lots of land available for development if you were prepared to cover, to, to clear the bush that was on it and drain it because it was pretty wet. Now that suited the Irish perfectly because if all you needed to buy land was a little bit of money, it was very cheap because of the hard labor that would be required to develop it. And that was something they could excel at. And that's why there is a ring of farming settlements around the Southland capital in the cargo with names that often include bush, but which have pretty much no bush now. The land there once cleared was developed into excellent farms and many of them were owned by Galway born people a lot of whom were from Anna Down. 
Myros bush, long bush, 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 Rakahoka. You know, you people in the south and will know all these places and you know what I'm talking about. And if you want to know a bit more about that, then I've written about that a couple of articles on my website. Um, there. That one there, the southern land. Little Galway on the Southern Plains, that was called the Wakahooka Church Centennial back in 1994. And then down the bottom there, our Scully history. I wrote that for my mum, giving her a general account of her, um, her Galway pioneers and their story. So you can see the um, URL for my website at the top there. If you can't see it, it's called The Brosnan, short spelling, B-R-O-S-N-A-N, and it's easy to find. And you look under my articles on that, you can download any of those articles and have a read of them. But there's another aspect of the migration chain that we have been examining that relates to the southern angle as well. <clears throat> now, the pioneers in, Otago, in, in the southern part of Otago, as it was in that period of the 1860s, got really annoyed that they got little of the attention of the provincial authorities in Dunedin, and little of the money was being spent on infrastructure in the area. So in 1861, they broke away and established their own province, Southland. Turned out to be a bad move in the end because it failed financially after about nine years and had to rejoin Otago with sort of its tail between its legs. But in the meantime, this new and short-lived Southland Provincial Administration established its very own subsidised immigration scheme. And the records for this survive slightly more substantially than Otago's one. And they have a specific light to cast on the strength of that ongoing Galway migration chain. Now, there weren't that many ships involved. There were just 15 in total, and they carried just over 1,500 assisted and nominated immigrants, plus about 700 other people who paid their own way. Southland had their own recruiter who was based in London, had an agency in Glasgow, and he always struggled to compete with Otago, who had their own immigrant recruiters at the same time, with what he could offer them in terms of subsidies for their fares. Because remember, it was still very expensive to get here, more expensive than going to America or Canada or Australia. It was more expensive to come all this way. So that was a big factor. Having subsidies to make it more worthwhile to immigrants was a key part of getting them here. Now, his instructions were to get as many Scots as he could. You know, the old emphasis. And Southland is more Scottish than even Otago. So he was reasonably successful. But he had to make them pay half of their fares up front, which was more than they required to get to Otago. And it often meant that he had to fall back on Irish candidates, most of them nominated by their friends and relations who were already in Southland. So for instance, when the 14th of the ships that Edward Thornhill was dispatched in 1864, over a third of the passengers were Irish, which was a relative disaster from the Southland authority, authorities' perspective, and which required some explaining from their agent, who was emphatic in his letters, that he always picked the Irish candidates at the very last, and only when he had to ship to fill and a deadline to meet, and he was desperate. But excuses notwithstanding, this disproportion of Irish people seems to have been the death knell of the Southland scheme, and they gave it away after 1864. But the passengers on the Edward Thornhill included my great-great-grandmother from Clonboo, Annie Finity, and others who appear on the Southland list before and after this were uh, the Boyles, some descendants here this morning, Coalfields, the Kavanaghs, the Crows, Fords, Fahies, Finities, Lavelles, Hughes, Quelters, Scullies, all names with a Galway and an Anna Down ring to them. And there may be others that I can't pick up. They're not so obvious to me. Now, the problem for Southland, again, was that Achilles heel of subsidized migration, the nominated migrants, you know, that once someone's here, they could nominate their friends and relations and they just scoot on through. Now, among the Scottish immigrants to Southland, nominated passengers made up just 25%. So they weren't quite so important. Among the English, it was 40%, so you know, more significant. But among the Irish, it was 71%. And the Anadown connection was at the heart of it all. Now, there was just one last immigrant recruitment effort on Southland's behalf, a last gasp in 1868 when they briefly revived their subsidized schemes with a ship, the Chile, which was dispatched and all of its passengers were um, nominated, every single one of them, by friends and relations who were already in Southland. And uniquely for Otago and Southland, a full record of those nominations survived. But first of all, let's look at these lists. So you can see there the Edward Thorne. I've marked up all those names that I know to be, or guess to be from, uh, from Galway. 
top and bottom on the Edward Thornhill. That was the disaster one where they gave it away. And here where they briefly revived, it's even worse. It's even more bloody Irish on it. And you can see there um, the names, the Boyles, Collinses, uh, uh, the Fords, Hughes, Qualters, all from Galway. But um, another little point to note about the nominations. Just because you were nominated, didn't mean to say you had to come. And, you know, there was a fairly high degree of wastage. People were nominated from, from, from New Zealand, got the, the offer from the, the authorities that they could get a passage on a ship. Bugger that. I don't want to go all the way out there. Didn't accept it. Now, in the case of um, this ship, there were 72 potential immigrants who were offered passage, half of whom were Irish, 40% of them from Galway. And while less than half of the Scottish people were nominated accepted their passage offer, 80% of the Irish ones did. And so they made up fully 46 people of this load of people. Um, 40, sorry, 60% of the 46 or so people that were on the Chile when it sailed. And here are their names. There was this list, the only one I've ever seen for Otago and Southland, where it gives the name of the person who was nominating the passenger and where they live. It gives their relationship to who they're nominating. Marvelous information. And then I put in where the people come from. I've noted there whether they came or not. And there are the nominees with their age, their occupation, and uh, yeah, age and occupation. So that, that's brilliant information, and which really exemplifies how crucial that ongoing connection between Galway and Adown in particular. See there, Clear Galway, Drum Griffin, and Adown, Athen Rye, and Turlamore. So all those places in Galway. So as I say, it's a unique list, and it's pretty special for us today in revealing that ongoing importance of the Anadown connection. Now, the Galway link continued to be of importance through the 1870s and 80s and that big surge of assisted immigration. And for that period, we do have lists like this, which enumerate the names of the immigrants, their ages, their county of origin, and their occupation. And from those lists, I can tell you that there were a further, further 640 Galway people who arrived in Otago or Southland in the 1870s and 80s. But by then there were lots of Irish coming from all over the country and Galway was only the fifth most important county of origin amongst all the Irish who came to Otago and Southland in that period. But it was still well overrepresented. There were twice as many migrants who came from Galway among that big group of Irish migrants as its proportion in the Irish population would have suggested. I think there were about 4% of the Irish population 8% of those immigrants. Now, I'd love to talk to you a bit more about those Galway pioneers and how they fared in early Otago and Southland. The way they intermarried their language, their customs, the religious ethnic network that they evolved as what I've called a little Galway on the Southland Plains. But we won't really have time for that today. Maybe another time. And of course, all of you can, can contribute to that. You know, that's one of the, the really necessary things that waits us to, to pool our knowledge and be able to retrospectively create a, a better knowledge of who those people were exactly. Because although we've got these partial lists, can't tell you how many came in that early period. Um, we don't have any way of determining that. The data just doesn't survive. You know, we, we have people popping up in different records so we could make a sort of a, a stab at it, but we don't have any firm, solid data. We just don't know how many. Um, and again, there's real difficulties in trying to triangulate information about people. And it's exacerbated enormously by the commonality of the names, the repeated use of, you know, Paddy Ford, for instance, my ancestor. And I want to share with you a cautionary tale about this because it tripped me up notably when I went to Anna Down in 2012, looking for the home place of my great-great-grandfather, Patrick Ford. Uh, arrived, we, we think, on the Melbourne in 1861. The guy that made the long time for Gabriel Reed was right on the field at Tuapeka when gold was first discovered, did well there, got his farm, prospered, did very well. But where did he come from? Well, 
The Anadown baptismal records show his baptism um, in January 1837. He was born to Michael Ford and Maria Boyle. Now, I then went looking on Griffith's valuation just a few years later to try and find Michael Ford and Anna Down. And sure enough, there was a Michael Ford who appears in the townland of Anna West. So I thought, well, that's the place. So I duly made my pilgrimage there. I had my two oldest children with me. We did a big tour right around Ireland. We went to every ancestral place we knew about, made the pilgrimage. Really significant, you know, very, really, really you'd know this. Those of you who've done it yourself, it really pumps for you when you go to those places. And particularly if you can find the actual place, you know, stand in the spot. So I was really thrilled that I could stand in the spot. And here we are. I'll just uh, switch back here. Whoop. There we are. There's me. This, this, this photograph appeared in a newspaper article I wrote about my uh, trip subsequently, where I proudly proclaimed I'd stood in the ancestral land in Anna West, in my great great grandfather's farm. This was the entrance to the farm. Uh, really chuffed. It's on my website. You can see it there. But turned out I had the wrong Michael Ford. And a couple of years ago, I had some descendants of this particular guy whose ancestor Patrick Ford also came to Otago. Uh, they very politely pointed out to me that I had mixed my man up with their man. And they could recognize this farm entrance as being Parkside Farm, their ancestral spot, which just goes to show, I think, the incredible value of local knowledge and why this connection with the Anadown Historical Society, with Irene and Paul, all the other people there who can tell us stuff that they know that we don't and we need to know to make those connections back how important that local knowledge will be. And likewise, what we know from the Otago South and End about where people went to, what they got up to. If we, when we connect those two parts of the story together, it rocks, but easy to get things wrong. So I tell the story against myself just to show how easy it is to make these errors and how important it is to share knowledge so that we can correct them and get things right. So that's, that's my time up, 40 minutes. I will just finish by saying that, um, as Irene and Paul know, here at Toy to Otago Settlers Museum, we have an ambitious project to do something of this reconnecting the two ends of the story by making a documentary, which we're calling Journey to New Edinburgh. New Edinburgh was the original name of the Otago Settlement Scheme. And in that, we are trying to do that. We're telling stories of the development of the Otago Scheme from its beginnings in Scotland, how it all panned out, the places where it happened, but we're also telling a hundred individual stories of pioneers by looking at what happened to them when they got here, but also where they came from when we're going to their home places and we're providing the context of what it was that led that person to choose to come here, how they got to do that and what happened to them when they got here. And we're gonna do it um, for the Irish story as well. There's some Irish stories amongst those hundred pioneers and in the general documentary, we're telling the story of the Galway pioneers and we're coming to Anadown. We should have been there in 2019. Irene knows this. Yeah. One of the key places we're going to is Contenti and William Kavner's family home, which Irene happens to own. And that was a great breakthrough, connecting up with her and knowing that we could go to the real place and tell that story, you know, on the spot and consider that first critical guy, where he came from. And we'll be doing it on film. So look ahead. We're hoping we can do it next year. We're planning to go in May, June, 2022, but you know, COVID stopped us doing it in 2019. It stopped us doing it um, last year, 20, and it stopped this year. Hopefully we'll do it next year. When we produce that, you'll be able to see it on the Toy2 um, YouTube channel. We, we've done a lot of these sort of documentaries and we look forward to sharing that with you. But meantime, I just want to finish by saying, uh, good on my agav, shalom. Thanks very much. Fantastic, Sean. That was absolutely amazing. Um, and Gurmahagat to Hain. I have posted your website up into the chat for anybody who might like to have a look at it. Um, uh, that was an absolutely uh, fantastic presentation and the information you have is amazing. Um, I was struck particularly about the name Kilkelly because the Kilkellys would literally be our, our neighbours literally over the road, the next cottage over. Um, and two other names that I saw in there that you hadn't highlighted that quite possibly Anna Down are goalies. 
It's quite an unusual name and um, there's not many of them around. So there are other possibilities for goalies. Um, so our thanks to you once again. Uh, and I'd like to open up the, the virtual floor to any questions that people might have now. So if there's anybody who'd like to um, to pose a question, you can unmute yourself and... Yeah, Chris, uh, uh, Sean, thank you very much for that. Um, I've just got a question about how many Patrick Fords there might have been, because I see in your documentation about the Southland nominated um, applications 1868, uh, the, the name Patrick Ford is mentioned six times. I know there are at least two. You're descended yeah. from one and I'm descended from another. But uh, do you know if there are others again? Well, that's the tricky thing, uh, Frank, is it? Yeah. The triangulation is really difficult because, you know, for those passengers, to make a positive identification, we'd really need to have something like an age, um, town of origin. We need, we need a couple of other factors where we can pick them out. And, and in some cases, it's just impossible. But where we can work backwards, so you know you've got a Patrick Ford and you know quite a bit about him, his life cycle. I know about our guy. When we can pull that information, we can perhaps establish, well, there's this one, there's this one. But yeah, we can easily cross tracks. You know, I've already done it. Is, is your guy the one from Parkside? Just unmuting. Um, no, we don't. We don't know a whole lot about wh where they were. Although right, so um, there's a third I, one. I, there's cousin, three then. My, yeah, yeah. Well, they may, they may well. Yeah. No, my cousin, um, or my partial cousin, uh, Kevin Ford, has done a lot, a, a lot of work on that. So he's got good details more than I have on that. Uh, right, okay. Well, you know, so the triangulation is the challenge. Because the passenger lists are either non-existent or really skinny, some of the people you can see on the nominations later who are nominating people, we can't see when they arrive, but they clearly did. My great-great-grandfather, William Scully, can't find out when he got here, but he was at Gabriel's Gully in 1861, so he was there then. He was one of the first people on the gold field, but I don't know when he got here. Um, so, yeah, that's tricky. And the commonality of the names is, is, is the challenge. And as Irene said, Thomas Kilkelly, well, there's at least two of those as well, you know? So um, yeah, that, that's a challenge, working out how many of these people are different people, how many of the same person. On a Ford, Annie Ford, and the way the names can shift as well, you know, it's, it's quite a challenge just trying to work out who's, who's who. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Yeah, just a quick comment, uh, Irene. Jerry Morgan here. Um, thank you very much for that. It's really interesting. I, I'm not from Anna Down, so I'm looking at it from the outside. Um, the, 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 the assisted passage list had um, placed people coming from Anna Down or Drum Griffin, which mm. referred to as a town. And it, it's possibly more genetic than, uh, generic than that, I should say. Possibly yep. referred to the, to the local post office. Um, so Anna Down would have been the western half of the, the Catholic parish on Drum Griffin, the eastern half, because that's the town that the post office was in. It subsequently moved to Corundella. That's why part of the parish is called Corundella now and part of it is Anna Down. And the other areas, Clare Galway, Charlotte Borden, Athen Rye, probably also referred to the, to the generic post, postal uh, area. I think that's probably very true, Jerry, mm. because as you imagine, you know, the communications are going to the post offices. So, yeah, that's a really good point. And so that's the sort of thing we don't know, you know. That's yeah. why the Irish end of the story is so useful for us. Oh, well, that will refer to this because it means that, you know, we, we get, well, I do, we get lost in the detail of town land and, you know, parish and which have been referred to at different points. But that, that's really useful to, to think of the post office as being the, the key determinant, yeah. And if I could just hog a, a final comment, have you, have you, do you use DNA um, data to try and triangulate all these Fords and others? Personally, no. Uh, when I was at a Brosnan gathering in Kerry in uh, 2013, I was prevailed upon to shove something up my nose and uh, give a DA, DNA result to someone who was doing something like that with the Brosnans in Kerry. But when I had to pay some significant sum to find out the results, I was too mean and uh, never bothered. So I don't know how that all worked out. <laughs> okay, very good. Just, just to support um, what Jerry was saying, I live in Cochinti, um, which is in the parish of Anadown. Currendola is across the main road about three miles away. But for our postal address, even now, my address would be Cochinti, Currendola, County Galway rather than Cochinti and a down County Galway. And it's certainly something we have seen in the records where people will put down Drum Griffin, where we know that they're not from the townland of Drum Griffin, and it is the post office address. So that's that's certainly something. 
Oh, that's that's really great to know that. Yeah. Um, could, could I just say that uh, also when I was researching uh, the caverns of Anadown, that a lot of them were registered, their births were registered in Turlock Moor, whereas we know they were living in Anadown. So that threw us, some of the older caverns were registered there and the younger members of the family were registered in Anadown. So that caused a lot of uh, wondering who or who was who. Do you know why that would be the case? It must have been where the office was, where you registered, right. was in Turlock Moor in the beginning at some stage, and then it was moved somewhere else. So that could cause its own trouble, like the post office. Right. I can... I can, I'm not Catherine Hodgkin, that's my daughter. I'm Anna Davin. Oh. And my great grandmother was Ellen Silk. And our early attempts in my family to find where everyone was from in Galway were not very successful. And it was partly this question of not understanding the townland system, the names. But Corandula was certainly where she came from. And when I made my first serious visit to Galway, all too brief, a few years ago and, and spoke about my Galway, New Zealand ancestors. Um, John Cunningham, from, with information people gave me from the audience, was able to take me to exactly where Ellen Silk's home was that she'd emigrated from in 1866. And I haven't triangulated terribly well between oral history and, and the documents, it's more difficult here, but I have found the um, the, the list of people on the boat that she went on in 1866 and the other, there were, she travelled with two young women also from Galway, Catherine Broderick was one and I've forgotten the other, but you can see that it's both chain, but it's also, there's an, another aspect of Irish migration was that very often more women went than men and that's oh, yes. most, it's most unlike any other migration pattern and, and certainly my family experiences and I'm sure lots of Sean's research as well will bear, bear that up. It's very interesting. Yeah, that's absolutely true, uh, Anna. Um, that, that's a distinctive feature of Irish migration in the 19th century is the willingness of uh, single Irish women to travel, whereas Scottish single women were very reluctant to do that in the early period. So it really marks a big difference and, and explains why, in fact, when they were desperate in Otago to get single women in the mid 1860s, they restricted assisted just to single women. It, it really favoured Irish girls. Can I just ask, are you connected to Dan Devon? It's, it's... I'm his daughter. Yeah, I thought so. I'm his eld eldest so, daughter. Well, so I was, you know, if I'd had more time, I was going to quote extensively from your dad's um, account, not not just refer to the it's fact very that rich, you know, he, wrote, he, he wrote a series of novels which mm. give us a very inflected sense of that community that developed here. You know, it's a really precious repository of sort of reflected information. But also, he wrote a piece... Um, which are in his papers in the Alexander Turnbull Library about the Irish New Zealand, which has some very um, neat uh, references to the Galway people in Southland. So I, I was going to read that out, but there's no time today. But it's great that you're uh, part of the show here today. That's that's a really precious reference to the sort of cultural aspect, you know, the the, the, the language, the customs. He 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 talks about some of those things from his own knowledge of of you know um, the pioneer generation that you don't find anywhere else. It's a very valuable record. So just uh, uh, kia ora to you there. Can I add to that? Uh, Southland Stories is a collection of his short stories based on his Southland background. And it's been recently very um, carefully edited by Janet Wilson and brought out. So that's something to get your library to get if you're interested in following very up. Very good. He is a wonderful source also on, on when he and my mother was met as students at Otago University in the 20s, early 30s. Uh, he's, he's very interesting on all of that in other fiction, <clears throat> which it seems to me is not all that fiction sometimes. Yes, and your mother, of course, is from Galway as well, her people as well, is that right? It was, it was my mother who uh, was Ellen Silk's granddaughter. Right. And she recalled that until her grandmother died in 1929, the family were obliged to speak Irish as well as English because her grandmother, he, she knew English, but she wouldn't speak it with them to make sure that the Irish kept going. Yeah. And my father's father was also an Irish speaker. And, and after mass on a Sunday, any newcomers from Ireland would 
be brought back to the house for a meal and an afternoon of telling stories in Gaelic, all of them. That's exactly what he, he details in this piece I was going to read out there, yeah. Mm. Same in my family, Annie Finity was an Irish speaker. And from what I've seen, you know, in occasional references to them, a lot of those pioneers were as well, um, which as I say, add, adds to the magnificence of their achievement and negotiating all that complicated, you know, thing. you think about it in the terms of our COVID world, you know, how the, the how, how you would travel anywhere in the world with all the things that are changing now, you know, how difficult it is to find those. Well, they found the gap, you know, they worked their way through that and yet they were ill-educated Irish speakers and yet they found their way from Galway to Otago. Incredible. Thank you. Um, Siobhan Lick Kelly here from New Zealand. Um, I recently was, I don't know whether, um, um, Mike, Michael Farragher is on today, but we met up and it's interesting because saying about the women um, immigrating, I found out recently that my great grandmother had four children and her husband died before the fourth one was born. And somehow or other she came to New Zealand and then married my great grandfather and had three children. And there really was quite a, a separation from it. That her eldest son eventually did come out, but it just shows you what they think that she probably came out here because um, just to earn money. Um, and perhaps we don't know if she sent money back, but you know, the desperation really of having four children and it seems as though the grandparents were there um, who probably looked after the children. So, you know, an interesting story. <clears throat> well, the other part of that too, you know, um, Colette is the opportunity that was here because, you know, th those people who were here early had a unique opportunity to get land cheap. You know, you, you know, an immigrant coming here to Otago and Southland today hasn't got a shit show of getting land cheap. You know what I mean? You know, but that opportunity was available for those pioneers with just putting in their their hard work. You know, they could invest in that, and and the descendants. You know, all those farms. There's so many farms in Southland still in the families. You know, we owe so much to those pioneers who seized that opportunity, and you know, being able to support their wider family was all part of that. You know, they did pretty well. Mm -hmm. Is she married? She married a Morris from Tipperary, and uh, and that's how then she she did. You know, that's how the family then continued on here. Yeah. I've had someone um, communicate with me recently from that family. I think someone married into the Scullies. I've got to reply to them in the next day or two. So we've got some connection there, Colette. Right. Good one. Uh, ju just. Um, um, Pierce Murphy is my name, and my uh, 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 great aunt, um, uh, my all uh, right, uh, great grandmother was married to Patrick Murphy, and her name was Bridget Cahill. Now, their daughter Bridget Murphy uh, emigrated to um, New, New Zealand Southlands. Uh, I think it was 18, uh, 1883. And I often wondered why, how she she got went to New Zealand because most of my my ancestors went to the U.S. And uh, suddenly I realised uh, from a talk that was given by the uh, Anadown Archaeological Society that a John Cahill went went uh, went out to uh, to. Um, uh, to Southland, I think it was 1860, he was one of the area people as well, and he was uh, her uncle. Uh, right. So she, that was how she went to Southland rather than the US, which was the, 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 where most of my ancestors went to. But he never married, uh, apparently. He, again, he worked on the, on the gold mines, I, I think, uh, for a while and bought some land in, in, in Southlands. But he never married. Now, she married a man from um, Orden Moor called Atai. Uh, and I would think that she, I, she probably met him on the, maybe, maybe met him on the boat on the way out, or maybe they had been uh, in touch before, or, you know, uh, yep. beforehand. But uh, she, she died in, uh, in uh, when she was in, in her forties. I think it was nineteen oh seven. But uh, 
and I had lost touch totally until uh, a DNA that I did came up with a, with a match for a, a person in, in, in Australia. Right. Who had who's was 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 um, a descendant really of of of, of the the Thais and and uh, uh, that that points to something that's significant too, um, Pierce. In that, I think the lack of literacy must have complicated the ongoing connectivity, if you know what I mean. Because after a number of generations, it's, it's, you know, in my family, I know there was correspondence back and forth for at least a generation or so. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that attenuates over time, doesn't it? It becomes more and more difficult to yeah. sustain a sense of relationship when you, you never knew the people and, you know, writing a letters. And, and I've, seen, I've seen letters written by Irish, um, you know, family descendants out here, and they get more and more difficult to sort of say anything meaningful when you don't know the people and then it sort of peters out. And so we've lost that connection over a long period that people had no idea of the South and connected, just faded away. Yeah. Whereas yeah. in some families, perhaps it was sustained. I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear from other people. Thanks very much. And uh, thank, thank you very much for, for your very enlightening talk tonight. It was, it was fantastic. And also fantastic to hear from all the, the, the people who are in New Zealand. Uh, you know, and, and uh, it was just lovely to make that connection. And I suppose this is one of the benefits from, from the COVID that we have got into doing things like that. that we wouldn't have uh, been able to, wouldn't have been doing before or thought of doing maybe. Yeah, thank you very much. Great. Anybody else like to comment or any questions? I suppose I'm thrilled with all the, the lists that Sean's managed to get and the um, his very neat skewering of, of the planned migration things and the way that the nomination system enabled Irish people to get round that. Uh, my on my mother's side, actually, they. I, I think she, uh, Ellen Silk, was on some sort of assisted program. She was a dairy maid, and maybe that fitted. And she went to Christchurch, where the Wakefield plan was very strong. Uh, but she, she met there her fiance from back in Ireland, who'd been travelling. The world until he could find somewhere for them to meet up and settle again. And after a bit of Christchurch work in the hotel industry, they saved enough money to buy this land in Southland, which Sean's been uh, quite rightly saying was coming cheap, but I didn't know all the detail of that, so I'm fascinated. And no, in fact, they first went to Omaru and they farmed there and saved again and bought cattle and took them to Southland, presumably by sea. But in the family, it was always said that they were the first ones to bring. I think it's a bit late, it's in the 70s. So I'd yeah, no, be surprised if they were really the first, but, you know, but anyway, so, so there, there's, it was their route to Southland was via Christchurch and, and uh, uh, going down that coast. But at the same time, she was bringing her brothers from Ireland and her mother wouldn't come until the father had died, but then she came too. So there was that whole chain and cousins and intermarriages and a whole nother set of names from the ones that you were showing, Sean, but loads of, I absolutely agree, this fantastic chain and integration, intermarriage and access to land and using um, family labor for everything and just making such a lot out from such a, a, a small slot sometimes. Yeah, well, you know, just mentioning Canterbury, you could substitute just about everything I've said. The English in Canterbury were, were not wanting the Irish as well, and in their provincial records, it's equally vituperative about the poor Irish were coming in. But again, we have a breakthrough there with the nominations, and in, in South Canterbury in particular, it's Kerry people, my people from East Kerry. It's a very similar situation here. Yeah. I also just want to say hello to Mary Newell, who's emailed that she's from Tonnegarain, which is where my father's family came from. I mean, not emailed, but chatted. I'm not very familiar with this, I'm sorry. I haven't seen any of those chats, yeah, very good. You could have a look at them there, Sean, for a minute. Um, well, I might just mention a couple of things. Um, I know you spoke about DNA 
there's quite a few of us from Anna Down who have completed uh, DNA testing. Um, and if any of you are interested in DNA testing, if you haven't already, um, there's a lot of sales on at the moment for Black Friday. So you can pick up a DNA kit for, uh, I think, about 39 euros. It's probably something equivalent in uh, dollars. Um, but we have a project uh, on Family Tree DNA specifically for people of Anadown descent. So if you have already tested your DNA or if you're considering it and you'd like to join that project, please, please do drop us a line. Yeah, unmute. Yeah, I can. Oh. And I'll, um, and I, I, I'll get you set up on that particular project. Uh, and a word of warning is uh, a lot of people in Anadown would have been marrying people who are quite close to them. Uh, there'll be a certain amount of cousin intermarriages there would also be people who are, you, you could be related to them on a, in a number of different ways. So your DNA connection may seem ever so slightly inflated than it would with a person who you had only one particular connection with. Everybody in Anadown is related in some way or another. So that, you know, it, it can lead you to think you're more closely connected than you actually are. Um, but in terms of genealogy as well, we'd be very happy to help anybody uh, in any way that we can with any questions that they might have like we do understand that we are in a bit of a privileged privileged position in that we're here we know things inherently just because we live here we know what townland is beside another townland and we know straight away if a name is probably an anadown name so we're delighted to help out in any way that we can if any of you would have any questions subsequent to this um and just in terms of the gwail took um status of Anadown and Sean mentioned that there were lots and lots of Irish speakers who insisted on speaking Irish when they got to New Zealand too. Anadown status is that of a Brat Gaeltacht and what that means is there are parts of Ireland where Irish is still the spoken language. Children are brought up in Irish rather than English. There's a number of these places uh, dotted around Ireland. Anadown would have been one of those places and at the time when these immigrants would have been making their way to New Zealand, it would have been the spoken language of the area. But as time progressed, there are less and less native Irish speakers in the area, but we've still retained our Gaelic status and we're trying to do as much as we can to promote and bring back Irish into the community. So for example, our primary school at the moment is taught through the medium of Irish and children who come in at the age of four or five are taught, are taught exclusively through Irish for the first two years of their schooling. So it's certainly a very important part of our heritage and something That's that we can down. cherish. Yeah. Um, if anybody has anything else they'd like to come in with, now's your, your chance. I'll just say uh, in the chat, there are a few people who talked about sending me something. Yeah, send me anything you like. I'd be always happy to receive it. I won't necessarily be able to reply promptly, but um, you can contact me. Do it, Joan. Oh, are you there? Is that you, Sean? Yep. Oh, it's Trish here. I, I spoke to you, and also I think it was Colette before. And my sister, Joan Gordon, is also on the screen at the moment. We're connected to, um, I wrote to you the other day. Colleague, yeah. all the information. Yeah, are you there? I recognise you. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, so I'm not very good at this this computer business at the moment, and I didn't know how to talk to you. Great. Well, I'll get back to you about that connection. <laughs> if, uh, you, if you could, but it's good to see the connection. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, my sisters and I uh, had Irish lessons in Oxford in our teens in the 1950s. And Delia, my next sister, went to the um, Gaelic College in the Gaeltacht in, in Donegal several summers running um, to learn Irish and, and work with. It was a combined thing where you had Irish lessons. We also worked on the farms and were put up locally and taught locally. And she later on went to China and most of her career was to do with Chinese history and economics. And one time, um, she, she, uh, well, there were lots of different connections like that, but anyway, she always retained her Irish. And when she was volunteering for the Samaritans in England, decades later, a West of Ireland voice was, she answered it to, and, and she, she reckoned this was a Gaelic speaker and spoke to him in Gaelic and he couldn't believe it. And it was a really wonderful oh, mix of generations and knowledge and language and sympathy. Oh, that's a lovely story. 
Yeah, the Irish language really is something special. So it is important to try and, you know, kind of mm. uh, try to protect it and, and, and keep it as much as we possibly can. I have a question, Sean, if I may. Yep. Um, there's a particular family who uh, went to New Zealand in the 1870s and they were a little bit different because they weren't Catholic. They were Church of Ireland. It was mm-hmm. a guy called George Woods and his wife was Honoria uh, Delaney. And they had a son with the most fantastic name of Neptune Woods, who made his, who made his way back to um, Ireland for a time, I believe. And he was in Galway running a hotel, I think, in Dominic Street, but then returned to New Zealand. And I'm just wondering if you had come across them at any point in your research, because they're just they stand out a bit. They're a little bit different. Well, I've never come across Neptune. What's the name? Woods. Woods. Yeah. But I can certainly have a look for him. Sure, you yeah, stand have, out, especially if a hotel keeper. Yeah, I have plenty of information on them, so I will email that on to you. Um, okay, yep. Thank you. Okay, I think that might be it, unless anybody has anything else they'd like to say. Um, once again, I would just like to extend our sincere thanks to Sean for hosting what was a fascinating talk. Really, mm. really interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you to everybody who contributed to the Q&A and uh, by all means get in touch with us um, for any follow-up questions you might have on it um, and we'd be very happy to help you. And we look forward to seeing you Irene. Absolutely. As soon as we can. I've cleaned we'll out the old house. I got two skips up during COVID. It's ready I've for got me. You. Nice and cleaned up. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Family papers I hope. Say again? No family papers in the skip. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was hoping to find. But unless I start pulling down walls, I'm afraid they don't exist. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. Nice. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.